podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. You're looking very serious today, Bob, and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be talking about in this episode is repetitive cycles in the therapy think- room. <laughs> I was just thinking about what you just said there, that I look very serious. I wonder if I was looking serious because I was thinking about what I'm going to talk about. Or if Maybe. I was serious just because I'm looking serious. I have no idea. But anyway, either way. I just um, looked up. I knew you looked very serious, Bob, which isn't like you. <laughs> Could you just say what that title is again? It sounded very long. but I like It's it. Repetitive Cycles in the Therapy Room. Yes. And you know what, Jackie? Um... You're correct. We're going to talk about in the therapy therapy room, yeah. And uh, and people, hmm, they go through repetitive cycles throughout the whole of their life. Yeah. Anyway, per yeah. se, from beginning to end. Yes. Um, whether we're in therapy or not, but we're going to particularly talk about. I think that process, and maybe the destructiveness of some of these patterns and repetitions which aren't useful yeah so for me one of the things that kind of came up for me when I was thinking about this title is I've had clients in the past and probably still know that we do some work on something and we seem to be making great progress and everything is going in the right direction. And then it's like we do full circle and go right back to the beginning again. And, you know, I can think of one particular client where we've done that numerous times. And in my head, I'm thinking we've been down this road before. Why are we not continuing that way? Why, why are we keep looping back? And it's obviously because they've not processed it or they've not, it's not come to a conclusion for them or or something the needs haven't been met i don't know what it is but yeah i know one of your favorite books is about mm, listen in a way um cycles of power yeah pam levin yeah pam levin so i know you like the idea of cycles yes um and repetitive behaviors aren't far off the idea of cycles absolutely yeah yeah and people come to therapy really, I think, for a couple of major reasons. One, to get a different outcome. Uh, and secondly, to understand themselves. And I think with these repeated patterns, we keep repeating them and repeating them and repeating them and repeating them um, under the hope that we'll get a different outcome this time. Yeah. I did a Is podcast. that a sign of madness, though, Bob, when we keep repeating the same behaviour? Yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm as mad <laughs> as a hatter, I think. But I just want to say that about three or four podcasts ago, we did a podcast on hope and dread, I think, in the cycle. Yes, yeah. And, and I was saying hope is the, one of the most dangerous words in English literature and one of the most liberating words in English literature. Yeah. Um, but here's the, the destructiveness. We continue repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating almost like learned behavior i believe for two reasons one with the hope things will change and that we'll get a different outcome and secondly um to well three really secondly for it, it, it complete structure but thirdly there's some relational needs which haven't been met so we keep repeating and repeating and repeating yeah yeah so I think the other thing before I go into this again is just to acknowledge what you just said there. Um, that if you talk to therapists per se, one of their frustrations quite often is that they do lots of good luck works with clients, or they think they do, and then the client repeats old processes over and over and over and over again. And um yeah, I think that's born out of therapists with frustrations, actually, uh, because they want to achieve a quick fix. 
but but um, I'll get away from that counter transfers. But I, I think people repeat, as I said, because they want a different outcome. Um, but we have to go, I think, with all repetitive behaviours, we have to go to the need that wasn't met underneath those behaviours. Yeah. In other words, how come these people are carrying out these repetitive patterns over and over and over and over again? And we have to get to the unmet needs underneath the patterns. Yeah. So game theory from TA is a useful piece of theory when we're looking at this. I mean, I know you know this because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So games. The definition of games in transaction analysis is a series of repetitive a series of repetitive patterns that we play over and over and over again as a maladaptive way or an attempt to get our needs met today. Yeah. Now where we started playing these behavioral patterns out was way back in childhood as a way to survive, but they don't actually uh, completely meet our needs. No, because nobody wins in a game. No one wins, but we may survive. Yes, absolutely, yeah. And it's familiar, and we know how it works, it's and all that sort of stuff. There's yeah. a sense of continuity, there's a yeah. sense of predictability, or, yeah, all those things, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but we may also just be simply surviving. Yeah. But we have to get to the needs underneath the behaviours for change to occur. Yeah. Uh, we both agreed on that? Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. So... There's you... also something for me about having to let something go in order to move on. And sometimes I think we become attached to our pain or our diagnosis or whatever it is and letting that go is a really big deal for a lot of us oh it's very very big deal yeah crikey i mean you know um to let go of behavioral patterns which are the basis of our script even how even if it's destructive scripts, if you like, or destructive, you know, destructive life plans. Yeah. Let that go and put a new life plan on the road. Wow, that's a often it's such a big deal, isn't it? It is. It is. And to me, that's that's underneath all of this stuff that we're talking about. <laughs> the so, the fear of letting it go, because often we've we've lived with it for so long. It's our purpose. It's it's yeah. That's correct. So what do you do then when you spot people and TA will be playing games, but other language is, you know, repeating these destructive behavioral patterns. What's your position as a therapist then? Well, usually I've been in sessions with the client for quite a while if we're repeating patterns of behaviour over and over again. And I do point it out to them. You know, I, I use humour a lot in, in the therapy. And I will, you know, literally say to them, I feel like we've been here before. Or are you getting deja vu or something? And kind of point out that, you know, even the words that they're using and everything is literally the same as what it might have been six months ago. And then just open that up, you know, as, as a communication that we can then discuss. Is this something that happens often that we repeat the same behaviour and, what you know, yeah, just explore it. Be curious. Do you work backwards? Um, possibly. No, I mean, thinking about the needs that haven't been met for the behaviours in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And... You know, I know we, we spoke, I don't know whether it was a couple of ones previously episodes about reparenting, do you know what I mean? And, and looking at the need that wasn't met. Can we meet our own needs? No. No. 
I, 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 yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah, but yeah. I was thinking that's an inter very interesting question. I said no almost spontaneously, uh, a bit provocatively, but I'd be really interested what your pondering or meandering is or thinking behind the question. When, when I was talking about reparenting and everything, and, you know, sometimes we get into the relationship with the client in order to, you know, parent them in a more appropriately, appropriate way to then let them go. Do you know what I mean? It's not about co-creating something where they're dependent on us, but at some point, you know, they've kind of got everything that they need and we can let them go and, and everything's... Oh, different. yeah, I think that's a different process. You know, it's like I often think of my job as a parent uh, with my daughter and when she's now 24 and... I think part of my parent is about part of the job as a father is to let go. Um, and so, it is one of the most difficult things as a parent is yeah. to let go. So, so, yes, and hopefully I've done a good enough job in terms of developmentally um, helping her uh, meet the unmet needs that perhaps were, were met, you know. Yeah. So I think that the significant other person, the parent, always, you know, this developmentally you know, uh, anticipates the needs of the child. And, and as the child grows up developmentally and goes through the developmental tasks, et cetera, et cetera, um, they work through those needs, uh, satisfies those needs and move on. If that's not, if those had needs haven't been met for mutuality, for self-definition, for self-agency, you know, if they have a need to express love, if they haven't been met, I think what happens is, is the infant child growing up will, how can I explain this, play out patterns of behaviours in an attempt to get those needs met from others. Yeah. Because they weren't met by the significant others. Yeah. And I think that will happen throughout life. And you will see in numerous films, books, romantic stories, uh, the people that play out with other people, often very destructive behaviours, an attempt to get the recognition they never got from their father, for example, or their mother. Yeah. So we know that happens. Yeah, yeah. So it's impossible to get, it's impossible to meet our own needs. And most people come to therapy anyway, uh, who are wrestling with unmet needs are attempting to get those needs met through the therapist or even if they don't come to therapy they attempt to get those needs through those unmet needs through relationships and often often destructive relationships and it's often while they come to therapy yeah. because those unmet needs have never been met so they play out these repetitive behavioral cycles in an attempt to get a different outcome and get their needs met that were never met all those years ago yeah i agree with what you're saying yeah i do agree with what you're saying but there's, there's something for me about i i don't know if we can't meet our own needs and validate ourselves and all that sort of stuff that we're constantly demanding it from the people around us and what and see as jackie i was I'm sort of puzzled because what is wrong with that it's like if we haven't had those processes, if we've yeah, not, not had the yeah. needs and we've not had the recognition, we've not had the validation, how can we thrive? Now, fortunately, you know, in 1984, and it wasn't, it wasn't me saying I need to go to therapy. Actually, someone came up to me and said, would you like to come into therapy? So I went into therapy for a very, very long time, uh, and you could even still say I am now. And through that process with a significant other person, it led the way to me being able to get a lot of the validation, recognition, and the needs which I never had as a child from a significant other person today. And therefore, different narratives and sense of self-esteem and resilience was built. You cannot do it if you don't get it. It's impossible in my head. Yes. Yeah. And I, I do, I do agree with you. 
But is it a constant thing that we're constantly looking for recognition and validation throughout our life? Yes, I believe. Okay. okay. I, I believe that. Now, now then we're into a whole other concept which you're talking about, I think, which is things like overindulgence, things like um, always searching and searching and searching and searching and searching. But you see, I believe that if we get the right nurturance, the right validation, the right love, we move on from that. Okay, yeah. We don't get stuck. Well, no, sorry, I have to go back a bit because when I said we're always looking for those validation and recognition and all that sort of stuff, I think we are. But as we get our pot full, we don't do that so intensely. Yeah. Yes. It's more a, a, a an entitlement through life. We don't have that intense yearning for what we didn't have. So therefore, we don't go into the destructive cycles. We yeah. pick people who will be having the same script as us, and we don't we don't then spend a life of misery and yearning searching for that process which we never had. That intensity is not there. There's been a sense of healing and a sense of transformation. Yes, I do. I do. I do agree with that, and I do get that. And you know, the the relational needs that we have, we we never lose those. The need for some, you know, the other to initiate, and you know, all that sort of stuff. That's not. We don't get it once, and then that keeps us going forever more. We're constantly searching for that. So I I do understand that. Yeah. Well, I th- I don't think search. I think it's. It's part, well, perhaps it is search, but it's, I think that it's part of connection. Yes, yeah. And part getting of, our needs met is, is, yeah. is part of a social, yeah. social arena. Yes. And I, I in what, my head, I think that's fine. Yeah. And I think what made sense for me was when you was talking about the urgency and the intensity of wanting you know the the more that we get our needs met the less Intensity. intense we are and the less urgent it is yeah, I, I what, completely I get that see jackie i think there's transformation then yeah i think that's the healing yeah we can rest in peace then so as therapists it's our job to notice you know, this repetitive cycle and, and take that as their needs still haven't been met. They're still looking for the recognition, the validation, and that's okay. Whatever it was. Yes, that, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Yeah. And all romantic stories, all many of the soaps, a lot of the dramas on television, they're all about what we're talking about right now. Yeah. And... Um, I do agree with what you said earlier on as well. I'm agreeing with a lot of what you say about that, you know, if a therapist is 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 feeling uneasy about this, it's because they're looking for a quick fix. Yeah, I think so. I and is it that. something to do with our ego as therapists that we've yes. been here once? Yeah. Why are you doing this again? <laughs> yeah. I wrote, as I said, the five I wrote something called the five most effective qualities that a therapist needs to cultivate. Number one was humour, I think, in my list. Number two was patience. Yeah. Yeah. To develop patience. Um, And we have to understand that even if we go back 50 times, 60 times, 70 times, there's a reason for why we're doing that. And sometimes we also have to confront those behaviours. Yeah. From a caring position. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what is being unmet or what is it that you're attempting to tell me that isn't being told for us to go back and back this way? Yeah. That's what I mean by a care and confrontation. Yeah. And I, I think, like I said, you know, I, I have pointed out to clients, it's a bit like deja vu. I feel like we've been here before. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So yes, I, I do understand that. Yeah. It's like breaking it, it's like the two of you breaking a code. Yes. Yeah. And it takes a long time to break that code. Yeah, because the client 
doesn't know how to do it. Yeah. They haven't got the tools. They don't understand the under, un, understandable. Yes. So it needs the therapist's patience, their wisdom, their caringness, their compassion to go to those places many, many times. And eventually we'll crack the code together. Yeah. And it's a really good way of putting it because we are, we are very complex creatures and it's not, there isn't a book that tells us how to do all of this because we're all unique and we're all individual and we're really clever at working out how to survive and cover our tracks very well. Yeah, though I'm writing a book. Yeah. Did this called <laughs> The Psychotherapy Cookbook. You're writing a book? Yeah, called Psychotherapy Cookbook. I need a copy when it's done. <laughs> it won't be done for a while because I'm one of the worst person disciplining myself, but I'm taking eight of the uh, basic mental health issues of the day, depression, anxiety, stress, et cetera, et cetera, and looking at the ingredients that make up these ailments and how we can put, how we can have different ingredients in our cake. I love that. And it is true. We, we are, we, we, I just think we're really good writing our scripts at a really young age and locking it and throwing the key away. And often we need the key yeah. To, yeah. to get in there and work it all out. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So it's about, and we, we do that to survive. Yes. And, and, and then we realise that survival is, you know, not just what it's all about, we need to, you know, we need to help to find the key to have a different type of life. Yeah. When we go to therapy. Yeah. I would never have gone to therapy. <clears throat> I started to go to a lot of personal growth groups in the beginning of the 80s. And that led to, to a situation where a therapist came up to me and said, you know, would you like to have some therapy? Basically, it wasn't quite like that. But, I was thinking that because uh, it's not very ethical, is it? It's well, going up to something. Talking about the middle eighties. You need uh, a bit of therapy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, middle nineteen eighties or something. It wasn't quite like that. I was saying a bit simplistically, but yeah. however, I got. But I was ready to go into therapy. I think, you know, and um, it, it needed the help of a compassionate, caring, loving other person to stay with me while I went through a lot of those destructive patterns. And eventually, you know, um, together we found the code. Does it depend? Like, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a direct question. Was, you, was your therapist a female or a male? A, fe a female. My you, first ever therapist was a female. Do you think that makes a difference? Like, if your needs weren't met by your mum, are you more likely to do better work with a female therapist well i think we should definitely have a podcast on this okay definitely but i'm going to answer that direct question since you've asked me directly okay but I, I think this is the perfect grounds for a therapist but as you ask me directly for me personally um you know it, it was important that i had a female therapist okay. i did pick a female therapist i can assure you or perhaps i did somewhere in the fate and uh you know whatever we believe in so maybe maybe i did but ostensibly it was a, a you know a female that that, that that i first went into therapy with and for me personally um and it's a really big question you ask actually um it was important it was a female now you can ask lots of other people then i say theoretically it doesn't matter that's why i said this should be a really good podcast because actually I think it probably does. But we yeah. need another podcast to talk through all this lot. But theoretically, many therapists as well, well, it shouldn't matter. And, you know, I've done lots of therapists about my father, by the way. I've done lots of, but would I, you know, it's a really interesting question. However, for me, personally, I think it, it was the love and connection from a female that I needed at that time in my life um to be able to go to where i have you know where i've now achieved to go to you know in terms of yeah. work, male but i'm glad i started with the female i i i love our podcast bob and the conversations that we have because in in the conversations that we have 
there's a lot of curiosity for me that comes up that I think is helping me as a therapist. I've never even thought that before about does it make a difference whether it's a male or a female okay. when we're looking at getting our unmet needs met. Theoretically, most people or a lot of them would say no. Yeah. But I think we need the space for a much larger discussion. Yeah. I mean, I could say, I could sit here and say, well, no, not really, because eventually, you know, I, I also needed to do work around the male, and perhaps you could even argue I need to do, needed to do it more. However, in terms of a starting point, I think it was important, important that we started with a female, for yeah. me. Because I'm not sure that clients think about that when they're picking a, a therapist. I always ask them. Do you? What, if they prefer a male or a female? I do all the assessments at the Institute. So that could be six, seven, eight a week. In the in the half an hour assessments, I always ask them that. Yeah. Now, the, you know, I was like, oh, no, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't really matter, female or therapist. But if I broke down, I would think... And maybe it's 50 50. Uh, uh, they say female, male, male, female, whatever it is. Invariably, quite a lot say I never thought about it. Then you ask them again. So, but when you push them again, they often said, Well, I'd actually think it might be better with a man. And then we have a discussion about that. So I always ask them out of courtesy and take an account of gender. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it should be a pot cut on itself. Yeah. Well, I've, I've written it down so that we can do it, but I'm not sure what the title of it will be. <laughs> oh, how, oh, how do, how do you know, something like, it's an important, I don't know the title either, I have to think uh, about that later. Well, that's it. I know it's an important podcast. Yes, I've, I've, written, I've written it down. So, that wonderful. So, it's okay. We, it's okay. I think that's wrong. We're, we're pretty much guaranteed to see repetitive cycles in the therapy room. Always. Yeah. I don't like saying 100% in psychotherapy, but I'm saying it 100% here. And, you know, we can look for positive destructive, uh, sorry, positive cycles. Usually people come in, of course, with destructive cycles. Yeah. With an attempt to have a different outcome. Yes. Yeah. But game playing in the therapy room is, you know, is really what it's all about isn't it <laughs> you know what I mean, in transaction analysis they defined a game this is why you're using the word games which i'm not sure why and this is a personal thing jackie it's really personal and i'm sure i like the word game uh, because some people then uh, take it negatively that they're responsible for game playing and i always have to point out you know this is uh, not what it's about a game if you want to use the word game is a series of behavior behaviors that we play and that we've learned in childhood as a way of surviving and getting our needs met. Which, and as yeah. well, the thing that I say to clients all the time is that it's it's a, a subconscious, we, we're not aware that we're playing the game. It's not that we set out to play this game, so it's not an intentional act. Yeah. No. It's a behavioural cycle, behaviour pattern that we, that we, we choose not necessarily from our awareness yeah. uh, as a way of surviving and getting needs best met as we can yes back in the day and maybe it doesn't work yeah well. yes yeah now, absolutely that's an outdated process and it needs out it needs updating yeah i so, think when i talk about this uh, most well all clients think that it's a conscious thing that they're doing where they're playing hmm. with the other person's feelings or emotions and they're playing a game and it's like no that's not what it no. is yeah no. ta that's really defined by burn and you know you, you just said you, in life people pay these patterns out yeah and of course people who come to therapy i think it's the therapist's duty to uh, look at these cycles and patterns that have played out in a destructive way which nowadays don't help us especially yeah. especially in communication and relationships yeah mm. And it is about being curious and peeling back the layers and working it out. And sometimes we get it wrong and sometimes we get it right. And that's yeah. part of the process. Yeah. yeah. Lots of inquiry for me about it. 
Thank you, Bob. Be more. Yeah, you you literally every conversation that we have, I I get so curious about things, and yeah, I, I really enjoy these. The yeah. Oh, thank you. So the next episode is 100, Bob. Oh, absolutely. I've, I'm going to get the champagne, as I said. I'm going to toast ourselves and all the people listening. And the subject matter we've chosen is? Change. Change. The importance yeah. of the concept of change in the therapy process. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, we're also going to talk about celebrating the positive changes as well. But that's a wonderful title for the 100th podcast. Yes, because I think with the podcast, what we can do is have a season. So this is the end of season one and we can start <laughs> season two with episode 101. <laughs> that's one way to look at it. Yeah, that's a marvellous way to look at it. Yeah, okie dokie. I look forward to that, Jackie. Okie dokie. Until next time, Bob. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.